Welcome to Green and Red, Scrappy Politics for Scrappy People, a regular podcast on radical environmental and anti capitalist politics. Brought to you by Bob Bazanka and Scott Park. Smooth sounds of the third year of the Green and Red podcast. I'm your co host, Scott Parkin in Berkeley, California. And as always, I am joined by. From the Montrose in Houston, Bob Bazenko, a Felice Anniversario. Happy anniversary. Yeah, happy anniversary. Uh, we're having a special episode today because three years ago, tomorrow, as of this recording, we launched the Green and Red podcast in on the on the on the precipice of the pan, covid pandemic uh and we just wanted to have an opportunity to sort of reflect back on some of what we've done and some of the thoughts and ideas that we had when we when we kicked this thing off back in 2020. we were we were actually we're on the precipice of a stack buyer so <laughs> we as, were on the little, precipice of stack buyer. as little carbine would have said yeah, was, uh, yeah ex exactly February 27, 2020, you were in Berkeley and I was in Italy. And just two kids with a dream. And who knows, who knew who the world was about to change. So. Yeah. And fortunately, we had a whole lot more time at home to uh, put together a whole bunch of episodes on, you know, what we thought was important for people to be hearing about, you know, whether yeah. it's radical politics, radical history, organizing, what have you. Yeah, uh, I mean, the three years. It's kind of a big deal. I, I didn't know anything about podcasting, but uh, not not many make it this far or certainly have as many episodes as we have. So uh, we, we're, we're doing OK. We're doing all right. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we, uh, we uh, the kind of important thing is that we we've been having a good time at this. Uh, we've been doing a lot of building and building relationships and having great <laughs> interviews and learning learning a whole lot and uh taking taking uh things you know to new levels yeah i've actually uh well i mean we're let's just i guess talk about like kind of what we wanted to do and where we've gone i don't know we don't really have a plan for this we just wanted to come out come out and talk to you all because it's been three years and we're kind of uh exuberant about it actually because what are there like i don't know how many millions of podcasts now and most podcasts don't even make it to like 10 episodes and very few make it to a year. So we've actually, um, you know, kind of actually hit March that we never, even, we, we didn't really have any kind of real goals in terms of numbers or anything like that. But if we had, I'm sure we exceeded them by now. Um, we brought some great stuff to you, but um, one thing you just said that I think is really important in my case, at least I've learned so much. Just I've talked to people who I would have never been able to talk to about, I just wouldn't have even known about prior to this. And I've learned about stuff that I wasn't aware of before. And so um, I know for me, it's been a real educational project that I'm assuming for people who listen, it's done the same. And if so, that, that makes me really happy. Yeah, and I think, I mean, for me, for me, I think up, lifting up the voices of people who are engaged in organizing and direct action, it's just been a, a core part of the, the work I've done a long time before we started the podcast. So I've really appreciated the opportunity we've had to bring those voices onto the show. Likewise, I, I've really come to appreciate and learned a lot about the particular politic and political analysis that we brought here. Not only do we critique, you know, the Trumps of the world and the neoliberals of the world, but, you know, we have a, we have a uh, pretty, you know, I think biting sharp nuanced approach to liberal narratives and you know cracks in the ruling class and it's something i feel like is really unique in many ways uh to what i hear in a lot of less media which i think is like kind of like garbage so <laughs> i mean you know like this is an extension of what you do and i think it is for me as well a professor is sure you know and um i think kind of i see this in that way too i hope i'm not being too didactic with it but uh, we do cover a lot of topics that I think are, are misunderstood, even among people on the left, and then we get a chance to talk about those 
it, you know, in some detail too. We're not just, you know, kind of going through something in a minute or two. And so we've been able to introduce all kinds of these ideas to you and talk about, you know, kind of stuff that's probably conventionally accepted, but, you know, really isn't probably all that, that accurate. Um, like you point out, we've talked about the way the ruling class is structured, which I think the left has to really understand. And that's something we'll keep talking about. And, you know, we've kind of talked a lot about it with the economy structure, you know, how capitalism really works. Um, you know, we've talked about the political system. I mean, it's really easy to attack Trump and his supporters. They, they're, you know, everything you want to say about it is true, right? They really are disgusting and reprehensible and dangerous. But, you know, I think it's also really critical. And, and we've talked about this so much to understand that if there's no resistance, you know, to them from something to the left of them, then it's real hard to just to kind of keep bitching about what they do, complaining about what they do and tweeting or, you know, about how horrible they are, making fun of them and how they go to Walmart and how they dress funny and all that kind of stuff. I mean, and so I think our critique of, of the Democratic Party and liberals, you know, has really been important in that regard. And, and uh, you know, and I think we do it not in a kind of a, we have fun doing it, but it's not in kind of a smart ass, this kind of way. I think we've kind of tried to explain the history of this and how it really works. Um, and that's something I think we're going to keep doing. So. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I, I actually feel like that's been a, a central theme. I, that's been a central theme to, you know, what we've done when we bring, you know, when we talk about, you know, the history of corporate liberalism, which we did in some of our first first early episodes, or when we talk about, you know, NATO liberals, which we did eight or 10 episodes last year on the background that led up to the, the war in Ukraine, which, you know, this is actually the one year anniversary this week. Uh, another anniversary, I guess you could say. Uh, I, 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 I think it's a, it's a pretty important part of the analysis, which is like very much lost, definitely in the mainstream media, but also lost within left media. It, it, I, I feel like some of the left media commentators maybe have the sense of it, but you don't have to hear them really articulate it. Yeah, we talk a lot about other left media, and we often get really chippy and snarky about it. And, you know, we're, we're probably always going to be that way. But I think the point here is, and I listen to other left podcasts, not nearly as, as many as Scott does. And I'm also on the other side of the, the mic a lot where I'm being interviewed. Um, and, I, you know, some of the interviews I've done have been great. People have been very the one on Left Reckoning, which was, which was really a lot of fun. And those guys really kind of knew their stuff, and that was a great interview. But I think often left media gets involved in these kind of personality things, you know, where they go off on AOC or the squad. They hate the squad. They love the squad. They, you know, they make excuses for Biden. They hate Biden. They, they, they worship Bernie. Worship Bernie. They, they worship Bernie. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, recently we've seen this bizarre stuff on the, the so-called left where some people like are just like pro-NATO intervention in Ukraine, hardcore hawks, worse than Kissinger. And then you see others who I think are like new bats who are like supporting Putin and see him as some kind of anti-imperial liberator. And, you know, we're dealing with a lot of personalities, people who I, I always joke, like the failed comedians who have these massive followings, like Jimmy Dore, who I think is an idiot, and Katie Halper, and, you know, I was making fun of the jacket of guys with, I think, good reason. And, um, you know, what, what we wanted to do when we got started, and I think this is something we've, we're really proud of, is we wanted to kind of give a voice to people who are really kind of unknown to that that celebrity lefty media and i think uh, scott in particular because that's his world has talked to people who i really would have known about who have told us about some of these organizing campaigns and, and struggles um and and the harassment and, and even legal uh consequences they faced and and that's something that uh based on what i you know in my followers of left media i haven't seen anywhere else yeah, I, I definitely think we have we have brought the voice of, we we uplift direct action and organizing, like I said, and we brought voices of not just organizers and people engaged in direct action, but we've also brought the voices of people who have been targeted, repressed, done jail time for for the direct action they organized. Uh, you know, we're close friends with both Jake Conroy and, and and Daniel McGowan, and they've been on the show multiple times. And you know, those are people who you know, organized a real resistance to environmental destruction, you know, animal, animal destruction, corporations, which are engaged in this government, which was doing the, the, the dirty work for those corporations. And, 
you don't really hear that in other in at least the pop, what I call the popular left media the, and definitely the media that's out of Brooklyn. Uh, and 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 I think that's uh, that's something that's being missed. I think it's important to be talking to people who have been fighting the state. You know, we've done a, a number of recent shows on the you know the tragic murder of uh, Tortuguita, assassination of Tortuguita in in Atlanta, and that's getting some recognition right now because it's become such a mainstream media uh, story. But you know, it, there's still there's still this sort of activist voice and this organizer voice that's being that's lost, and I, 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 I get particularly disgr particularly disgruntled about it from like left media because they claim to be of the movement and they talk about the movement, they talk about being revolutionaries and they like to think back on the history back to the Wobblies or whatever. We've done a number of show on the Wobblies too, but I, I I just find that a bit you know disingenuous if you're not talking about the people who are in like real struggle right now. Yeah, I mean, when, and when we started, that's kind of the green and red. That's where the the, the name comes from. Like green being environmentalist, red being kind of anti-capitalist or radical politics. And you know, I think we've carried through on that. Now those are you know kind of those are the kind of shows that are going to grip you when you say we're going to have on so and so talking about you know line three, and you and Jake especially did a lot of that. You know, that's not as exciting as people in Brooklyn having you know celebrity guests or having a debate against Zizek or something like that, you know. Or or a or a Twitter or a Twitter war. Like yeah. You know. Yeah, we're not gonna be uh we're not gonna be spending our time here shitting on Jordan Peterson. He does that to himself plenty, you know. So uh but you know we've also we've had some good good guests on. I mean we've had um Noam Chomsky on several times and we've had Ibasevich and Lisa Fithian and, and Scott Crow and uh, Dave Zyron and, and so we we do do that and we we have fun too. We've talked about movies and The Godfather and uh, Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan and stuff like that. So it's a it's a potpourri of of uh, political you know analysis and information. Yeah, I I particularly enjoyed our our pop culture interviews and and episodes. Some are some are interviews and some are ones that we put together ourselves. And I I. Uh, I feel like the cultural critique that comes from popular culture, from like left center, left center, whatever you want to call them, center left musicians and and screenwriters and television producers and movie ma filmmakers and all that stuff is is important and it's one way in which they're kind of communicating to like a greater audience and the, and the fact that a lot of people that's even kind of lost some people like people a lot of people on the right identify with Johnny Cash, you know we've done a, a show with historian Mike Coat. Mike Foley on his book Citizen Cash, and it's very clear that Johnny Cash had a lot of social justice values, um, and the and us being able to bring up that sort of cultural resistance, I think, I think is important. And I really like those shows. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, in in many ways, that's kind of our first introduction in, in a lot of cases to resistance is through kind of some of these cultural things. I mean, when I was young, I think a lot of it came from like listening to music, right? Listening to protest music or protest songs and um, as I point out many times, he's a professor. I play music in, in class a lot you know, because of, like Springsteen said, I learned more from the three minute record than I ever did at school. Uh, and, and that's a good way to kind of get at people. And I think on the left, that really becomes, unfortunately, I think too often the, the debate stays within that cultural realm. And so you have these pissing matches of somebody getting canceled or we can't let somebody say that or, or all that kind of stuff. And I think that's something we really don't talk about that much, but I mean, that's clearly a problem on the left writ large right now. Those cultural shows are always a lot of fun, and I think it's a it's a good way to learn uh, as well. You know, it's not didactic, and we can talk about like the politics of The Godfather, or the best political movies and the best political TV shows. And you know, as you pointed out, we you know we did a show on uh, Johnny Cash with, with Mike Foley. We did a show on uh, Woody Guthrie, and and those are always fun. You know, to kind of just kind of you know step outside your zone a bit and have some fun with it because I think you know culture is important. Uh, you know, uh, if, if you can't dance, then, you know, you don't want to be part of the revolution, right? So Yeah, a famous uh, person said that, right? Yeah. Uh, allegedly, I'm a bold, but I've seen it attributed to others as well, so I don't know for sure. But Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. No. I just, I just think that, I, I, I think the kind of importance of the shows that we've talked about serious issues, we've, we've talked, we talk about 
you know, we had a show immediately after the Capitol riot, for example, in January 2021. We've had shows that have brought both of us the tears or guests the tears, but then also we've had these sort of fun shows around pop culture where it's it, it feels less serious and less intense, and it's still an important thing to it's still an important sort of thing to be noting and commenting on. I also just want to say that I'm, I'm holding out that we still need to do an episode on on the politics of Mad Men. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Sopranos, for that matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah that too. We could do that as well. You we know, get Michael Imperioli gone for that one. Yeah, hey, if, if you're out there, uh, Chrissy, just listening, get us <laughs> out. Uh, you know, I know that it's, it's difficult because, like, we do this hoping that people will listen to it and, like, learn something from it. So, in a sense, we are being kind of didactic, you know, and, like, we're, we're, we're kind of arrogant or egotistical enough to say hey you know you need to hear this you need to listen to it. you need to do something about it and you know i can't really apologize or deny that because it's true but um you know i think i think that all of us are, are in a position where we can continue to learn stuff which is why we do it and you know I, like i said i've i've learned a lot from this uh i have become far more sympathetic in, in, toward uh the uh the people who identify as anarchists than i ever was before and I wasn't really like one of these cranky old men who said, hey, Antifa is a gift to the, you know, I, don't, I never believe that anyway. But, you know, there's just so many different political variables out there. And I think one thing that, that strikes me, because we started talking about this in late 2019, Trump was still president. Uh, the left was just going nuts about Bernie Sanders. Um, you know, the media was continuing to say, oh, the economy is great. When in fact, you know, the structural problems were there. And then boom you know, very quickly COVID hit and the whole world fell apart. And so we're looking at a world that's very, very different than the one that existed, you know, just a few years ago when we began this and we started talking about what we wanted to do with it. We had to really kind of shift on the fly because we actually had a lot of plans and those gave way to dealing with like crises, right? Talking about COVID, talking about riots. We had a, we talked to people who were in this recent court, but, you know, uh, we talked to people who were doing, you know, a jail, a bail, bail relief and things like that, that summer. And so it's a really different world now. And, and I think we've kind of adapted to that pretty well and had some good stuff about it. But yeah, I mean, we're trying to kind of, we're, we're basically saying, hey, you know, we have something we're saying, just like everybody else, just like a million other people are telling you that, right? So you need to listen to us though, instead of them, right? We're still, we're still have more sharper analysis and are funnier and more handsome. I just want to <laughs> put, oh put, that, put that out there. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, I know that one. I'm not feeling well right now. So, and and we kind of touched on this before or a minute ago, but like I also just want to really emphasize that, particularly particularly the 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 analysis around the cracks in the ruling class is something that you don't hear other sort of deep dive left analysis media get into, and I think you know you really bring that, Bob. You sort of done a lot of your academic, built a lot of your academic career around some of that. And I think that's actually really important. And I think when, when I talk to people who are listeners, who are friends of mine, they're, they're like, that is so good. I've never really thought about that. And then that recent interview you did on left reckoning, I think they must've been particularly touched by that because they actually brought that up and had you talk about it as well. Yeah. I mean, I think in, in general, and left and people on the left generally don't think about it like that. They think that the ruling class is a monolith. Yeah. And therefore they have to wage war on all of it, not figure out how to turn it against itself. Yeah, it's hard because I want to say this without insulting like the left, right? But but the reality is I do think that we've kind of been, you know, in a lot of ways miseducated. I mean, look at the people, I mean, here we go again, but like you know, look at the people who tend to become like really popular on left media who have like a million followers. And you could, you know, I mean, and they're they're just not not sophisticated they're not right you know i could throw a million names out there but what's the point um but i i do think it's important to understand that that there is nuance and complexity in the way these structures work that the capitalists the people who run the government the people who run corporations people who run banks you know and and if we just kind of go ahead first and say i mean there are there are enemies i get that you can say yeah they're all bad yeah i, I get that too but the reality is they're different and we don't have, I think that's one thing left it is kind of like doesn't have a concept of power or we were talking recently to, to Ben Case about you know, violence and the left doesn't really do well with tactics either. 
you know, or, or strategy for that matter. So, I mean, it just, I think it has these ideas that are very earnest. It's earnest as hell, right? Dedicated, right? These people are bad. We need to go do something about it. We're going to take you down. But the reality is, and tragically, we're seeing that in Georgia right now. Look at the freaking ways the state, look at the strategies the state has to crush people. I mean, they they can do it violently where, you know, they execute, you know, toward. Um, they're bringing out all these legal mechanisms that are just, you know, they're, they're, they're filing terrorism charges and uh, they're using, you know, kind of laws that were designed to, to attack organized crime against people who are sitting in, in a forest. And and I think that, you know, in a situation like that, you have to realize what you're up against. So, you know, a lot of these lefties who are all gung ho, you know, like I want to be Ho Chi Minh, I want to be Fidel Castro, but it's, it's, it's a lot harder, I think, than that, you know, um, we, we have to be incredibly smart and tactical about this. And if we can turn them against each other, which I think at the end of the day is what you have to do, right? Uh, that's kind of, I think, really crucial to just getting them to kind of see the distinctions that are in I mean, in the summer of 2020, right? That's what we did. 20 some million people, 25 million people were in the streets and essentially forced corporate America to say, okay, Trump has destabilized this country and it's blowing up and we can't let this go on any longer. You know, they didn't, I mean, they put on, they put the BLM flags and the rainbow flags out, you know, it was performative. You know, they don't, I don't think they really, I mean, some of them may have been, I don't know how sincere so, that was. The, the Kente cloths from the yeah, they call leadership. Pelosi, oh my God. We got it some point, we got to go on a rant about Pelosi to give her our less than fallen farewell. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that they, they weren't really doing that. I mean, it, it may have been somewhat sincere because they do need consumers, right? They need black people and gay people and Asian people and Mexican people and everybody else to buy their stuff, right? They do want that absolutely, and to go to their movies and to go to their sporting events and all that kind of thing. So clearly, there's there's that motive there. But at the same time, I think just this, the country was so unstable; it was blowing up, and that's not good for anybody. That's certainly not good for business, right? I mean, you know, if they they can crush everybody who wants to put a brick through the Bank of America window, but it's just a lot easier if you just people aren't putting bricks through the Bank of America window, right? and I think that's the left has to understand and that there was a moment there uh, that, that really, I think it was coming together. And of course, the Democratic Party and a bunch of liberals, you know, co-opted it totally. You know, you, you see that in environmental work all the time. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel like you see that ac across the board. And I, 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 I think that liberals actually do a pretty good job at marginalizing radicals and and they usually marginalize them around tactics. I, I, I think I agree with you that there's a lot of strategy that doesn't really happen because I don't, not even always sure that people understand strategy. Uh, and, and then, so it becomes tactics and people are like, you know, gravitate toward tactics and then liberals and the establishment and the ruling class is not just liberals, but like, you know, the, the right does this too. Although the right also, plays the tactics game and not a strategy game, at least the, the right in the streets. Um, but, and then there's like marginalized and and then there's nothing, you know, it's it's very challenging. It gets hard to break out of that. I feel like in 2020 was this like, you was this moment that's, you know, maybe like 1968 or 2011 where, uh, where we see, uh, you know, a, a majority of, of the country and, and, and globally, we start seeing, you know, people like, oh yeah, this makes a lot of sense. These structures are not working for us. These are things that we need to, you know, backlash against. And it was, you know, it was, you know, before 2020, it was happening in 2019 in other parts of the world. We saw uprisings in Colombia and Chile and France and places like that. So it was inevitable it was going to come to the U.S. Uh, but, you know, it's in. But but then, without that sort of like flashpoint moment, then you know, less people are out. Uh, media is able to influence a lot of people by, you know, bashing defund the police or bashing street movements or having stories about violent Antifa. And then, and then, you know, those who are still remaining in the streets, it's easier for them to be marginalized by the, by the establishment. Yeah. I, I, you know, so we've that was a whole big that. opine right there. I hope that was okay. <laughs> no, I mean, one thing that we've talked about, um, is that the, I keep going back to this, the, the Arno Meyer line, right? The persistence of the old regime. You know, when you think you have these people on the run, you might, but the reality is they have the amazing power to retrench and come back at you. You know, the forces of order are very strong and the forces of movement tend to be very 
fragmented and, and more. I mean, you know, look look at you know what's happened just since we started, right? You know, we had this horrific pandemic, which Trump just ignored. He punted on it. You know, hundreds of thousands of people died. Biden's basically doing the same thing now. Then you have this 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 street uprising based on, uh, you know, not just the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, but you know what that did was kind of blow open this issue to the point where a majority of Americans started to say, hey, this is a real problem. Police are out of control, and it's okay if you burn down a, a police precinct, right? And and then you had January 6th, right, where you had this violent attack on the Capitol. And you would think, based on that, that the parties responsible for that would have been discredited. And in fact, they're not. They're, they're as strong as ever. They, I would argue they run the country. You know, they, they didn't win the elections, per se, but they run the judiciary, and they run key states, and they kind of get their way. They set the debate. After all that, that that's, that's you know, I don't want to be alarmist because this is another thing we've talked about a lot, the kind of alarmism and hysterics on the left. Coups, fascists, fascists, coups, you know, everybody loves to get hysterical and freak out, but not do anything about it, you know? I mean, it's as if you can tweet a million times a day about how the fascists are coming to get you, it's going to stop them, right? You have to do something, you know? But the reality is, they haven't been doing anything. And and these conditions, which in you know, in anybody's mind would have been fatal politically, right? They would have destroyed. And in fact, they're not. I mean, Trump is still running basically neck and neck with Biden and polling. And after after everything he's done, he has, he has dinners with white nationalists and he's, you know, just committed a million crimes. And, you know, he says the most batshit crazy stuff. And uh and, and yet, you know, his followers are advocating violence. It doesn't matter. But you're ignoring the fact that he went to East Palestine and handed out some bottles of water and Goya beans and ate some Big Macs and played some golf. He had out some hats. Too. And and this one, is, you know, he's he'll he'll he's more of a president than Biden will ever be. And I mean, and, I, and also, I, I get that. Oh, go ahead. Go. I was just going to say, I, 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 I agree that Biden has structural problems things that happened in like East Palestine were as much Trump's fault as they are yeah. Biden's. And, and uh, Trump has just completely been able to sort of turn, turn that particular issue around. Uh, exactly. It's like a culture, yeah. a culture war thing. So, yeah. you know, it's, he, he fucked it up as much as the, as the yeah. Democrats. And you know, he's like, at least with his following and with, you know, Fox News audience, he's like winning. No, that's a great example. I think that's a perfect snapshot because that's East Palestine. That's like thirty minutes away from where I live in Ohio, and uh, that's that's a Trump area. That whole area is, is heavily Trump, and and yeah, clearly, I mean, Trump had you know just gotten rid of Obama era regulations, and obviously didn't give a shit about you know railroad safety or anything like that. And when that happened, you know, Buttigieg, who's like a lot of real percent, didn't do anything. Biden's you know throwing billions around in Europe and doesn't say anything about East Palestine. And Trump went there. And it was funny because, you know, in the media, it's that the Democrats see this as a gift to them because they can bring out, you know, Trump's, you know, this, you know, re rescinding regulations. Like, really? That's the fucking thing you think that people in East Palestine are going to think about? Oh, Trump rescinded. No, they're going to think about this guy came here. He cares about us. You know, he does it. I, don't, I think they don't think they think he does either. I think they know better, but he fucking can't. He pretended. He showed up. And, and all I hear is like, and then, you know, on social media, when you point that out, you got a lot of people, oh, they voted for Trump. Let them starve. Let them be poisoned. Like, that's like, that's a great freaking lefty attitude. So, I, I mean, I just, I just always say like, you can't go after Trump in the right until you deal with these people because they're in the way before you get to them, you know. Speaking of the structures, that's how it's set up to, to be like that. The, the, the liberals spend way more time waging war on the left as we've done mm -hmm. shows on. Everything from, you know, you know, federal law enforcement doing the bidding of the Democrats against activists, to, to uh, you know, beating up on the the left, the, the minuscule number of people who identify with the left in the in the Democratic Party who are like in the Congress or other other institutions around the country. Yeah, I mean the 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 Republican right is like. Crazy, right? It was like Marjorie Taylor Greene dates, right? These people are like they're they're John Burns crazy QAnon out there, right? The Democratic left is a bunch of people who would have been like 
Gephardt liberals or Tom Harkin liberals in the 90s, you know. So there's no equivalency. Oh, they're left with that. The extremists have taken over both parties, you know, like extremists, you know, like you want good schools for your kids, you know, you you believe that, like, you know, you should do something about healthcare. That's an extreme position. Whereas for the right wing, it's like, you know, we think you should be executed, you know. Harkin's Park, the one who com- counseled Bernie to think twice about running for president because it could put him in too much debt. Because what? It would put him in too much personal debt. Oh, really? Oh, Jesus Christ. And Harkin was one of the good ones. He was one of the good guys, you know. I mean, if you look at the past 30 years, and this is something, you know, I mean, and we did a great interview, long interview with Noam about that, but we did a, a, a couple follow ups on our own. I mean, if you look at American politics since like 1972, you know, you have this incredible progression, pro- procession of the Democratic Party to the right, because Republicans just keep going further and further out there. The Democrats just say, hey, and, you know, if you ran on a, on a, on a ticket of, you know, we're going to get out of Ukraine, or we're going to slow down the war, no more wars, whatever, which Trump actually gets them. He, he owns that issue, gets them. Oh, uh, you know, no more wars, health care, uh, student debt relief, and legalized weed. Let's say that, four things. I think you get 60% of the vote. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and their corporate sponsors, you know, continue to prevent them from doing. And, and in fact, in East Palestine, all these people who are wearing like Trump hats are bitching about corporations. That's the word. Like, that's fucking insane, right? The Florida Republicans are going after Disney. The GOP is positioning itself as the party against corporations and in favor of like working people. And they got away with it. I, you got it. That's. I, I should not quit. Offend, I should quit offending the Washington generals because the Washington generals were part of a, you know, a scheme and they actually went out and, you know, did their best. I mean, the Democratic Party, I don't know what the hell. I mean, I get I get that they're corporate hacks, but so is the GOP. Why is the GOP able to do this shit and to go after Disney, to go after corporations? The Democrats sit there and they have like, I, I, you know, Mayor Pete. These, these conservative state legislatures are currently passing legislation or have passed legislation against wall street around you know around climate issues like like wall street's like fairly progressive compared to like many other institutions in this country on on climate and fossil fuels in 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 some ways and and you know the state of texas or the state the state of florida or whatever are passing like legislation where they're saying they can't they can't not invest in fossil fuels or they're going to be losing you know some of their revenues connected to state governments in those states and and yet wall street you know they, they get away with it like greg abbott like overwhelmingly won you know yeah. uh, ron DeSantis is probably is potentially although i think trump's gonna give him a fight gonna be the next presidential candidate yeah no it's, it's quite remarkable how they they are able to do this that's and they really like to call themselves populist right and you have like ted cruz who it's it's really striking, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, we can sit here, we could do every podcast about horrible the Republicans and the right wing is, and I just think that's pointless. You know, it's like, kind of it's, it's boring because it's what everyone else does too, and it's out there, it's just you know visible. But like at some point, it's your responsibility to stop them, to create a political movement to stop them. And when you have like organized labor, which is to do when you have Democratic Party essentially saying drop dead to the railroad workers, you know. Uh, when you have Buttigieg, who didn't even act until I, actually, I got to give got to give you props to David Sirota and Lever News for for running with the story and not letting go. But Buttigieg went to East Palestine the day after Trump was there. Yeah, yeah. And so you got to wonder nothing. why. Yeah, and essentially said, "We're going to talk to Norfolk Southern." Jesus Christ. Well, well, there's there's a whole. I listened to a clip of it today, and there's like a whole. There's a whole like language he uses there where he talks about norfolk southern as partners and all all we have to do is make them to be better partners yeah. not not the you know corporate you know railway barons that just led to like one of the worst environmental disasters in like modern american history yeah right? i i've started calling it chernobyl ohio you know yeah, yeah i mean exactly. the, the, the stories i'm hearing from people in the area are horrific i mean it's just you know dead dead animals in the water you know the chemical residue in the waters and who knows what's in the air and the drinking water there. But I mean, you know, think, think about that. You have this party, which is deregulated, uh, Jimmy Carter and others. We should talk about them in a, in a minute too. But this party, which is deregulated the hell out of everything, like corporations do whatever. I live in Texas, right? And, and there's like no regulations in Texas. So whatever is a hurricane or a tropical storm, who the hell knows what's in the water, right? The same party that's done that, you know, is now poisoning people 
in East Palestine and in a million other places. And yet they can go down there and, and win. They can win the political battle by saying this is about woke politicians and you know corporations suck. And the Democratic Party is sitting there. They are utterly, I, I, I don't know how to describe it. It is the most incompetent, ineffective, you know, uh, corrupt uh, political unit. I mean, they, you know, they're great at raising money. Jesus Christ, can they raise money? And then what do they do with it? They get themselves reelected on a slight margin. Yeah, except in New York, where they couldn't even do that. Yeah, exactly. Think about that. The New York Democratic Party, New York. <laughs> yeah, shit. Uh, kind of, kind of back, back to the sort of themes of the show. Um, I, I do want to talk about the. Uh, you know, you brought up Carter, so talking about ex-presidents, another ex-president, which I feel like actually has been a pretty strong theme on this show, which kind of overlaps, you know, stories around history and pop culture and, you know, challenging, uh, challenging uh, uh, narratives or what I like to call false narratives. It's been the, the JFK conspiracy. Uh, and, you know, you've debated uh, Oliver Stone's screenwriter, you did basically another debate with like one of the leading experts on on the conspiracy, one of what I call like to call the assassinologist, Jeff, Jeff Morley. And so I, I think that's actually been an important piece of what we've done. And you've you've been maybe engaged in some Twitter back and forth with some of them as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think so, we're I think we're part of that now. I think Green and Red has like really kind of established itself as a as a part of that resistance to those, you know, lunatics. Yeah, and, and I we, think. I think the fact that we bring, you know, you know, historical fact to a lot of these discussions, whether it's about Carter, which we can, we can, we're dangling out there in front of you, audience, or, or, uh, or JFK is is a sort of like important role that we played in this in this left media ecosystem. We actually did a JFK show, like even before the Stone stuff was reissued, so we were kind of, um, you know, on top of that, and and you know, like I, I've been critical of Jimmy Carter, and I've written about him done a show on him. And, and the stuff I written about Carter has been really crazy popular. I'm surprised I'm getting like, I've always got huge numbers on it. And the thing is like, Jimmy Carter's a great guy. I, I find him literally like genuinely admirable and, and inspirational. But that's kind of the point, right? That this guy could do such amazing things after he left the presidency. But as president, he couldn't, he didn't. He was, I, you know, basically he, he committed war crimes. He began this, this uh, period of deregulation and neoliberalism. Uh, he, he, you know, kicked labor in the ass. Um, you know, he, he, you know, when the, when the steel mill shot at Youngstown, he did nothing to help them. You know, we talked about that with regard to stock lid, right? Uh, so why, why, you know, like, I'm not out to smear him. I'm not out to like, you know, I, I genuinely think he's an admirable guy, but I think this is probably the left Carter, JFK even more, right? They look for heroes. They want freaking heroes, right? Bernie Sanders, the squad, you know? Like they always need heroes. And the reality is, is like, you know, I think this comes out of the kind of Martin Luther King, you know, who was, he was, you know, if anybody deserves to be a hero, it's Martin Luther King, you know, but the reality is, you know, you have these massive movements that, that are, that are much broader than that. You know, there's not an individual, like, you know, if, if Kennedy had only lived, if Kennedy had only lived, nothing would have fucking changed. Nothing, you know, if, if, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter, but like, no, Jimmy Carter was a, a, he was an imperial, arrogant, oligarchic president. He would have been president otherwise, you know? And I think people have to realize that we're, that's why we do these history things. We're not just like pissing in a punch bowl to be nasty, right? It's, there's a reason for it. You know, that the people in these positions are there for a particular reason in order to kind of serve the interest of a particular class. And it ain't yours, you know? Yeah, I mean, we often refer to, to you know, contrary to what Oliver Stone and and his uh, his assassinologist acolytes, I love that word, assassinologist uh, acolytes say, is that you know he was a true cold warrior, and oh. Carter Carter also true cold warrior. The the early interventions in oh. Afghanistan after the Russians and invaded in seventy nine, you know that was that was Carter and Carter and Brzezinski. And, mm -hmm. and it's like important to point out, like Reagan continued it, mm -hmm. uh, but like 
followed that confrontation with the Soviets, particularly in Afghanistan and some other places, Nicaragua, uh, was was uh, was was Carter being a cold warrior, despite and, what a good guy he's been since he's left the presidency. And actually, what I'm seeing in the last like, week since he went into the hospice, I'm seeing all these liberal articles essentially praising him because he segued into Reagan. You know, that's that's a virtue now. It wasn't Reagan who won the Cold War. It was Carter who won the like, Jesus Christ. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot to unpack. But uh, And that also, I think, speaks to something else with regard to the JFK thing, especially it's this new left fascination with conspiracies. Like, I'm starting to see this more and more. More like lefties all over the place are talking about the deep state. This is all I hear, the deep state. What's the, I, what is the deep state? What's a conspiracy? I'm not even sure anymore. Like, they'll say, like, look at all these conspiracies. Now, list like 40 things. Well, if 40 damn things happen, it's not a conspiracy. That's just policy. That's just doctrine, right? But like the deep state is what the CIA, the NSC, like those are government institutions. You know, they're like, they're out there. Like they're covered in the newspaper every day. Like the overthrow government's like, yeah, that's kind of what the CIA does. You know, I mean, there's a huge difference between overthrowing the government of Guatemala, Iran, Iraq, and killing a sitting president, JFK. I mean, think about that. That's a big, as I, you know, my, my new line is like, Killing a president is a big fucking deal. You don't do that casually. Oh, you know, Operation Northwoods, let's kill Kennedy. Like, no, that's not the way it works. You know, that's a big deal. And and everything now is conspiratorial. Some of these people in that JFK, the assassinologist, Diogenia went good. Oh, my God. Pinto and, and uh, Pinto and uh, Dorf. Flounder, right? Flounder. 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 That's actually <laughs> stuck. I have people saying that. I'm kind of proud of myself for being an asshole like that, but. I mean, everything to them is part of this, like, it's incredible how they contrived everything down to this. Let's talk about reductionist. Like, everything is reduced to this deep state conspiracy, which, of course, I guess, doesn't that assume that the rest of the people are good guys? Like, the conspirators are bad guys. I don't, I don't see any good guys in government. Do you? Never, uh, you know. Well, it's except for like... Kissinger, who, who says the U.S. should have expanded NATO. Right? Yeah. yeah. I'm on the same side as Kissinger and Kennedy, and, you know. All these people now. <laughs> we're all we're all Putin's bitches, according to 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 some of the people who told me that. So <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I, I do I do find I do find it pretty interesting that the the conspiracy, it's all these secret behind the behind the scenes sort of uh machinations of the of the deep state when it's like what you said, it's policy, it's these agencies which actually are doing the same thing they've been doing for a long time. It's, it's co maybe it's covert ops, but yeah. uh, but but it's you know it's it's a, it reminds me a little bit of what, what did Chomsky say that actually the the real news is what you see on the on the business page, and yeah. Yeah. and and it's all right there in front of us and it's all easily accessible. It's not some secret sort of you know uh, you know cabal or whatever doing things that oppress the rest of us. It's it's doing things to oppress the rest of us, but it's it's how it's all been set up and it's out in the open. I mean, yeah, we're seeing that right now with, with Cy Hirsch's story, right? And, and we're trying to get him on. I, I spoke with him last week, and we're still working on that. But, you know, it's kind of funny because a lot of these people say, oh, it's conspiracy theory. It's like, it's a covert operation. Like, you know, what's the conspiracy there? Like, the, you know, you've got this special forces group that allegedly work with another country, and you blew up these pipelines, which are really vital to the Russian economy. I mean, I like, that's a covert operation. I mean, that's like... The Cold War war is is full of that. Like, I, I don't get it. You know why? You know, uh, it, it's just everybody wants to look for these like ulterior motives. And to me, the far more radical analysis is like what's right in front. I remember nine one one. You know, to me, the most radical analysis is Jesus Christ. People hate the U.S. so much that they would hijack planes and blow up buildings with them. Like to me, that's chill. You know, not oh, it's Mossad. It's like it's, I know it's like that's how. That's the U.S.'s position in the Middle East. That's what empires do, you know? That's the kind of pain they create. And, and, and you know, everybody's looking for these kind of, like you said, the machinations, when in fact, you know, the reality is this is this is how the state operates. You know, and there aren't good guys and bad guys. There are different levels. I mean, again, it's not monolithic, you know, but it's, uh, and Carter's a good example. I mean, Carter, after he left the president, I've never seen anybody and, you know, transform himself like that. I mean, I should talk about Cannon, who I think did too, but Carter even more so. Just remarkable and genuinely an admirable guy. But 
he became admirable because he created those conditions which were so horrific. So he could renounce them and recant, do good stuff. But he was responsible for the problem to begin with. You know, he's cleaning up his own mess in a lot of ways. Yeah, there's probably a, a lot of regret there for like the last 40 some odd years. I, I think he's a genuinely, a genuinely good human with a beautiful life. I really do. I mean, uh, but I'm not going to ignore what he did in, in, in throughout the 70s, really, before he became president. You know, he helped kill the McGovern campaign, uh, trilateral commission, uh, all kinds of like neoliberal think tanks, deregulation, uh, you know, uh, attacks on, on, you know, uh, democratic labor movements, things like that. So what's, what's been uh, your, like, if you had to pick like two or three things that like you liked the most or, you know, kind of got the biggest kick out of it, you never thought you, you know, do since we started doing this, what would they be? I mean, I think some of my favorite episodes have been some of the pop culture ones, particularly when we're when we're interviewing guests who who speak to some of that, because I, I feel like that's the sort of nuanced sort of like resistance, cultural this cultural resistance, I think is the is a, is a very nuanced piece. And I like us you know, lifting that up. I also really, really have liked how we've had this sort of ongoing theme, whether it's through the politics or the history that we talk about, whether it's with guests or not, about challenging the sort of like liberal slash neoliberal narratives, which are two different things, but they're very much interconnected. I, I've kind of gotten a kick out of that. Um, you know, the fact that we've interviewed Noam Chomsky four or five times has it, it, been like a bucket list sort of uh, piece with me. Um, and then just, just the raising, also raising up the voices of lots of organizers, because I, I, cause I, I, one of the reasons I started this podcast is I'd really gotten into podcasts right before we started. And I would listen to all these people talk and they would be just, you know, yahoos, you know, telling you what they thought about things in the world, but they weren't actually talking to organizers or people on the ground, or if they did, they would talk to them for like three minutes and then, um, uh, a comrade of mine told me who who actually did go on a number of those shows say that they don't like talking to activists because they think activists are boring. And I I just, you know, felt like we need to do something more with lifting up the voices of people who are, you know, kind of holding a line, you know, for for or at least trying to hold a line. And I think that's important. And I think that's one been one of the bigger kicks, you know, talking to folks in Portland who were fighting in the summer of 2020. Uh, talking, you know, going to line three um, and, and you know, having a couple of shows about line three, having a couple of shows about Atlanta recently, all of these are just like great examples of that. Yeah, uh, I mean, and that's kind of what we talked about at the beginning, um, you know, how we wanted to kind of let people know that this stuff was going on out there. And I'm not surprised that, you know, a lot of the other podcasts would consider that boring. And I've kind of, in, in conversations I've had kind of, you know, behind the scenes with people, who are part of that New York scene or, you know, kind of, you know, part of the Jacobin crowd at one point, all said that, you know, they just didn't really care about movement politics and movement organizing or anything like that. I think, um, obviously, personally, I, I've gotten a real kick out of the, the JFK stuff. I mean, uh, to be, you know, kind of in, in involved in that. And it's been a lot of fun. I mean, it's just like, I think they're nuts. I really do. I, I don't think they're very bright. But to be part of that, I mean, and, and it's I, the sad part is it's the debate they want. I mean, I think two thirds of Americans probably believe that now. But I've I've actually really enjoyed to be able to debate Eugene and talk to Morley and continue to do this stuff, and I'll keep doing it. It's just been a lot of fun. Um, I think I've also really liked the stuff that you mentioned earlier. When we've talked about things like uh, the way the ruling class is actually structured, uh, you know, whether this is fascism, whether there was a coup, uh, you know, what happened on January sixth. It's it's funny because you know I think I think you're kind of like this too. Like on one hand, I'm incredibly bleak. Like I'm just really really uncomfortable with the world. Uh, on the other hand, um, it, it, the people we're up against aren't nearly as invincible and and powerful as I think a lot of people on the left think. They're they're really pretty pretty incompetent in their own right. I mean, both 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 groups are the Democrats, Republicans. You know, I mean. Uh, if I may be crude for a minute, you know, as my father used to say, he's so stupid he couldn't find his dick in the dark. And, uh, 
Um, you kind of have a lot of that going on on both sides. But I think, you know, people have this idea and they create this, oh, they're fascist. And they're, you have this idea of this like 50 foot tall monster, you know, stomping through Tokyo or something. And I think that, that what we've done, we've talked about the way the ruling class is structured the divisions in it. And, you know, just like how Donald Trump, the military hated Trump. We've done, those are two of my favorite shows we've ever done. The military against Trump and Wall Street against Trump. I mean, and to this day, I mean, you'll occasionally still see an article. We were, we were way ahead of the loop on that, you know? Yeah, I want to, I actually want to, I, I want to, I'm actually something that's something I meant to say earlier is that I actually feel, even though we don't have the audience or the numbers or whatever of, of some of these shows, we're, we're highly influential. We're influencers, Bob, is what we are. And, uh, and, and I actually, I actually think that a, a lot of that, for example, and I, it struck me when you were interviewed on Left Reckoning the other, the other week, and, and they were asking you about that, because I actually think that is a, that, that is an analysis that uh, other media outlets have taken since we've said that kind of tried to take credit for it, which is bullshit. But um, I just want to say that I, I feel like us being influential in, in that sort of boutique sort of left podcast way, I think has been important. Oh, on that issue, I, I mean, we were talking about this in like early 2020, you know, like Mark Milley, who, you know, I know as a lefty, I'm not supposed to like praise, you know, generals, but I, I think Milley's an admirable guy. But we were talking about Milley early on. We were talking about Jamie Dime early on. And, you know, when it, when when you have like, you know, insane hysterical people like the lead political writer for Counterpunch, uh, you know, it's fascism, it's fascism, coups, coups, you know, freaking out, not giving any, you know, advice on what to do about it. And you and I were saying like, well, chill out, look, you know, Millie, Diamond, these people aren't going to let this happen. You know, what happened on January 6th was terrifying and horrific and violent. But thankfully, you know, these guys at the end of the day couldn't find their noses in the dark. You know, I mean, they committed mayhem and violence, absolutely, but they weren't going to take over the government. Just also that those are the folks when you point that out as Millie and Diamond and the National Association of Manufacturers and whoever else are, are not going to let that happen. And they're like, you're a reactionary because you support yeah. Mark Millie and Jamie Diamond, which is also <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, it's like telling me I support Putin because I want this freaking bloody horrible war to end. And we were, I mean, the shows we did on that were great too. I mean, that was really great. We have like a seminar on Ukraine if you're interested. We have like 12 or 13 a lot of them are just Scott and I talking about the background, talking about, you know, kind of issues at the time, but we also talked about the military, um, you know, military industrial complex corporation that with uh, Prothop, uh, Chatterjee and Bill Hartung. Uh, we talked to um, the great Andy Basevich. I'd uh, love to get him on again. Uh, Clinton Fernandez. So we, we did some great stuff on Ukraine. We were ahead of the loop on that too. And it's stuff that today you're not really getting in the mainstream media. Uh, and you know, I mean, Scott and I obviously are not Putin's, you know, uh, uh, puppets or anything like that. But um, it, it's, I mean, it's crazy. Like, you you even more than me really catch hell uh, for some of the stuff we've done on Ukraine just simply because we've said, look, there needs, that, that thing needs to end. Like, when did being a peace advocate become a problem on the left? I, I'm stunned by that. I mean, you got yeah. hell for it. Weren't you called Putin's puppet or something? Or, you know. I think we both were. Yeah. I think when they said it, they were talking about both of us. Uh, just, uh, yeah, so anyway, you know, usually our shows do have some structure. And even when it's just you and I, we actually talk about it. So today we just decided, since it was three years, we would come on and just kind of talk about it. Because I think we're both somewhat humbled by it. It's been, what, 200 and 205 shows, something like that? No, I think we're like 210, something 210, like that. Okay. You know, three calendar years, 210 shows, that's you know, that's 70 a year, which is quite remarkable. Uh, and of course, obviously, COVID, you know, made it, you know, gave us something to do. That kind of got me through that for six months. Uh, but now, you know, our numbers, we have, uh, what, 42, 4,300 YouTube subscribers. Um, some of our shows have got, you know, 25, 30,000 views. And, you know, we don't have the kind of, you know, agency behind us that a lot of those like big New York or Jimmy Dore or majority report type people do. You know, this is just uh, mostly Scott, you know, just hustling and, and doing stuff. And we're telling friends and posting it all over social media, doing whatever we can. And obviously we appreciate, you know, all of you who listen and watch and hopefully uh, tell your friends about this. And of course, especially those of you who uh, sent us a little uh, a little, uh, little bit of a, a chatter 
we appreciate that a lot. We have some small overhead costs, but they are real. Uh, but, you know, we're going to keep doing this. And, you know, if you ever have any suggestions or questions, you know, from our, we've actually done a few shows based on uh, viewer uh, questions and viewer requests. I think we did our first JFK show based on a request from one of our one of our viewers. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I do want to say that that uh, we have a great production team, not just me, that works on this. I want to like give them give them big props. They help promote our promote us in the algorithm. They edit our edit our stuff. They design stuff for us. Uh, you know, Isaac, Tobin, uh, folks like that do have been doing like great work for us. Um, either no bono or low bono and much appreciation, much appreciation to them. They're, they're like solid folks and really glad that they are into the project and help us as much as they do. Our um, executive producers, Jeff and Pat. Yep. Yep. And our recent, recent executive script consultant on the Ben case, it was uh, our friend Graham, who's also been a guest. Yeah. Um, and then uh, uh, also want to thank uh, our we, we also have someone who helps us with our money. Uh, and so big props to our fiscal sponsor, the Oil and Gas Action Network, for supporting us the, the way you have over the years, including being a donor, but also helping us, uh, you know, with, with tax, tax deductible donations. So, um, and, and we, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, you go next. Well, I didn't want you to forget our musical director. I don't know if you were going there or not. But, oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, when when you hear not every episode has the green and red blues, but when you do hear the green and red blues, big props to uh, Moody, our 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 music director. And and you don't even know this, but Moody has just uh, recorded a song, and it is going to make its global debut on Green and Red podcast as soon as it's oh made. oh excellent excellent. Yeah. I also want to thank the the mystery lady who uh, introduces our show every episode. Uh, big you know. She's she's on every episode at this point. That's it's been a, a great ride. I mean, I can't believe it's been three years. I remember that first episode very well. Uh, it was kind of surreal because I I didn't know what the hell was going on. I was stuck in Italy. I didn't know if I'd like you know I don't know what was going on. I knew things were kind of getting serious. It was the first day. Like I thought, oh something's going on here. Like I hustled back very quickly after that, and then boom, you know, the world kind of caved in on us. And so, uh, this really has helped get through it. And I know Scott and I've known each other for a long time, but obviously, it's been a lot of fun. You know, we chat like, all the time, and we're we're you know closer closer than ever. And you know, it's, it's kind of fun to help to kind of have some to, to talk about with those folks. And we've got a lot of great episodes coming up too. Uh, we did, like Bob's, like Bob said, we're we're pitching uh, Seymour Hirsch. Uh, we've got some other people on the on the schedule and uh we also have a lot of ideas for episodes that'll be just us talking about the history of this or the history of that or the politics of you know some pop culture thing that we like and then we geek out on with our friends so and if you have any ideas to it. yeah just send us an email at greenredpodcast at gmail.com uh and like like we say we're like real real big on uh you know audience our audience uh, being part of the, being part of the process. So just feel free to give us all kinds of ideas and connect us with people or guests or whatever. Um, and thank you. We, we couldn't have done any of this without you. I mean, if, yeah. if, yep. if no one was watching and listening, we probably would have stopped doing it. But, yep. So. Yep. Uh, it's been a lot of fun and we're looking forward to more. Um, also want to do a big shout out to, our donors, our recurring donors, and our patrons, which are like two different groups of people, but you know we're we're getting like a, a we're getting a chunk of change, and and that's what's helping keep us afloat. So big props to those donors. And if you want to become a donor or a patron, go to greenredpodcast.org backslash, or excuse me, greenredpodcast.org and hit the support button. Or if you want to become a patron, go to patreon.com backslash greenredpodcast, um, and we've gotten some new recent recurring donors and, and one new patron. So much appreciation to y'all. And, uh, and then let's hope, let's hope the next three years are as, as much fun as these. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if also, if you want to like check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, if you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, 
and uh, we need all of y'all's support. So thanks very much. Here's to the next three years. Song.